Give the Lord a hand praise. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm sitting over there and I'm thinking, listen, the worship team ain't got to pump me. The worship team ain't got to prime me because I didn't, listen, this week has been a week because I knew that I was going to have to deliver the word of God. So the enemy got on his mission and started bothering me on Monday. He was bothering me on Tuesday. So when I come into the house of God today, I'm going to bless the name of God. God, I extol you. God, I lift you up. God, I bless your name. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. If you don't give me another breath, I'm going to spend this one blessing your name, Father. Hallelujah to your name. You are worthy to be praised. Listen, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I heard a story. I heard a story and it blessed my soul. When you worship and you praise God, it, it sends up signals into heaven. There was a story that is proved that is that is said to be a true story of some women that went out to a remote location. It was a rural remote location and they wanted to go explore. And, and it was about 30 degrees below zero. And so they went out in the snow, 30 degrees below zero, and they went out to explore. Well, they got word from the base that they came from, hey, y'all need to come on in because it's the, it, there's a snowstorm that's coming through, and the temperature's going to drop to less than 60 or more below zero, and can't nobody survive in that. So I want y'all to come on back to base. So what they did was all the women took ropes, and they tied themselves up one to another and they headed on back to base. They headed on back to base. And then when they got back to base, they noticed that there was one lady that was missing and they were scared and they said, we gotta go back out there. But the people at the base said, no, you can't go back out because if you go back out there, you're gonna die. That storm is gonna take you out. We gotta wait till in the morning. And the story goes on to say that the next morning, first thing, that they got in a plane and they went out to find this young lady that they lost. And when they got to the young lady, she was still alive. <laughs> Through all that snowstorm, when it was 60 plus below zero, she was still alive. And so they took her back and they said, now lady, what happened? What did you do all night? And her response says, well, I'm a Christian. She said, and what I did was I started to praise and bless God. She said, and what the Holy Spirit told me was don't stop dancing and don't stop singing. She said, so what I did all night long to keep myself warm, when it was 60 plus below, when the snow was coming down hard and the wind was blowing, she said, I just kept on dancing. I just kept on singing. He said, they said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They said, in order for, with the only reason why we found you, they said, it's because there were flares that were going up in the air. They said, how many flares did you let off? She said, I didn't let off not one flare. She said, all I did was I started dancing and I started singing. She said, and when I got tired, the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. Keep on dancing and keep on singing. She And what I believe in my spiritual mind is that she was dancing and as she was singing, it was sending Holy Ghost flares up to the throne room. And so God says, no, 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 no. It's like SOS to God. And so they knew exactly where to find her. So what I'm saying is when you get in your tough situations and you need an SOS from God, this is your moment and your opportunity to keep on dancing and to keep on singing and to keep on dancing some more and to keep on singing and to keep on dancing. And all you're doing is sending heavenly flares up to where he knows exactly where to find you. You're leaving an X in the snow so he can know exactly where to find you. I'm going to bless God today. Guys, listen. Listen. All week, I've been telling the brothers and sisters, something just ain't right. Something's just not right. I'm struggling. Something's not right. I'm all over the place. Normally, when I know that I have to share the word of God, I get a little bit excited. And I pray, and I get in the presence of God and figure out what he wants me to say to his people. But all week... The enemy's been on my head all last week. The enemy's been on my head. So when I get an opportunity to come up in his prayer, obviously he lost. Because I made it through the week. Obviously he didn't win because I'm here right now. So I'm not going to miss an opportunity to say hallelujah, to say thank you, Jesus. Father, 
Father, I bless you. I appreciate you. I love you. I give honor to my pastor in his absence. Y'all know I like to joke and say, give honor to my husband in his absence. We're going to get into the word of God. But guys, please, let praise be your response. Let worship be your response. We're starting a new series. The series is called Tool Up. We're right now. And the purpose of the new series, now typically pastor opens a new series, but y'all know he's gone. So I'm going to do it. Y'all don't have to live with that. But the purpose of the series is to get us to know and understand that the battles that we face are not physical, but they're spiritual. And so we as believers have to make sure we got some tools in our pocket to be able to handle the enemy, his demons, and his devils that come up against us. Sometimes, guys, guys, we be mad at people, and it ain't got nothing to do with them. The enemy's mission, God's not his job. When you have a job, you clock in, you clock out, and then you're done. It is not the enemy's job. He don't clock in and clock out. It is his mission to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He doesn't want you to be what you're supposed to be in God. He doesn't want you to supposed to do what you're supposed to do for God. He don't. That's his mission. And so we have to recognize the enemy when we see him, and then we got to use our tool. So today in the first lesson of Tool Up, Pastor, aren't you ready? My title, I'm going to give you the title first. Title is Stand Right and True. Stand Right and True. And our foundation scripture is in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14. So that's where we're going to start. Ephesians 6, 14. Go there. You got to read it. You can't just let me read it. I didn't read it a whole bunch of times. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 is going to be our base scripture. And I'm in the NLT. It says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. And the body armor of God's righteousness. I'm going to read it again. It says, stand your ground. Putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. So the first thing, it's very interesting to me. The first thing that is mentioned is the first thing that you have to do is stand. So what do you mean by stand? Standing means to be erect. It means to hold your place and hold your position. Listen, when you when you look at come 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 come. When you have you guys ever seen a fight, whether it was a professional fight, boxing fight, MMA fight, even if it was just a fight on the street, have you ever seen a fight? Answer me one question. Come on, y'all talk to me. Answer me one question. Have you ever seen a fight and one of the people are sitting down? Have you ever seen a fight where somebody's sitting down? If he's sitting down and I'm the opponent, who has the advantage? I've got the advantage, right? The Bible says the first thing you need to do is stand your ground. Again, to be erect. Come on, come on, soldier. And to hold your position. Now, you're a fighter, Jordan. Show me your position. Oh, okay, Jordan. <laughs> Look at his position as a fighter. Now, wait a minute. Notice his feet. Notice his feet. He's not standing like this because he has to hold a position. 
His legs are spread apart. And then look, he's got protection across his head. So if the enemy comes in like this, he can block it. This is prayer. This is praise. So when the enemy comes in, look at there. When the enemy, look when the enemy, you can always in that, when you have your position. See, this is the problem. This is the problem. Because us as Christians, we say, we want to name, yeah, I'm saved, I'm saved, but we don't want to fight. We don't want to get up. We don't want to stand for Christ. What we want is we want to be popular. We don't want to have no power. What we want is we want to go ahead and go viral. We don't want to be effective. And see, the problem is, is that in order to fight the demons and the devils that you're going to have to face, you're going to have to get up out of your seat. You're going to have to hold your position. Look at me. I'm the enemy. If I'm over here, watch what he does. Watch what he does. He moves when I move. Listen, what he's looking at, he's keeping his eye on the opponent. He's not taking his eye off the opponent. You want to know why? Because he's looking for an opportunity. He's looking for a weakness. He's looking for where he can expose the devil. He's looking for where he can get some licks in. He's looking for where he can defend the reason why some of us won't have, don't have. Listen, this is why the enemy comes in and he wrecks our homes and he wrecks our churches is because we won't, we won't stand. Look, trust and believe. The enemy, he's looking for a weakness. Yep, she struggled with fornication. Maybe I should have our dude call. Yep. Look, she struggled with drinking. She's been delivered but I'm going to have somebody offer her a drink. He's looking for a weakness. So tell me why in God's name, as Christians in the body of Christ, we don't spend time with God and look at our opponent and exploit his weaknesses. Tell me why we don't do that. And then you wonder why you don't have no power. You wonder why when you pray, your prayers don't go nowhere. It's because you don't want to stand. You don't want to stand for God. You don't want to stand for truth. You want people to like you. This is the season where we ain't got time for people to like us. People are dying and going to hell. We have to be in truth and live truth and stand in truth. So the first thing, thank you, Pastor Jordan. The first thing is we got to stand. 614, he said, stand. Stand your ground. Put that scripture back up. But Pastor Ant, 614. He says, stand your ground. Guys, it would look really silly. He took the chair, Doran. It would look really silly if I'm a believer and I'm trying to fight the enemy like this. Tell me how that's going to work. Tell me who's going to win that fight. Guys, we have got to stand up in God. We have to let our yes be yes. Listen, listen, we have got to stand for Christ. So the first thing we got to do is stand our ground. We got to hold our position. We have to look for our, we got to look at our enemy. Listen, the Bible says that the devil, that he walks around as a roaring lion. Looking for who he can tear up. Looking for your weaknesses. He's looking for your weaknesses. He walks around. Who am I going to bother today? He literally does that in the spirit. Look and see who can I get out that game? Who can I get to not trust God? Who can I get to fear? Who can I get? He's, look, he's look, look, looking who he can tear up. So if the enemy is doing that to us, why are we not taking any defense or any offense? It should never be a time where the devil catch you by surprise. You want to know why? Because you should be constantly communing with Christ. You should be constantly, constantly spending time in the word with him. So that in the end, a lot of times what God will do, come on, I know, is when you're spending time with him, he'll say something coming. He'll say something coming. He'll prepare you for what's going on. Because though you might not have the insight, your father does. And he can give you the insight that you need to be able to take out the devil. This is spiritual. He wants to keep you from being who God wants you to be, going where God wants you to go, doing what God wants you to do. So the first thing we have to do is stand. It says stand your ground. Verse 14 goes on to say, hold on.
putting on, sorry, y'all, my mouth is so dry, putting on the belt of truth. King James Version says, Has your, having your loins girt about with truth. Wait a minute. I got I to gotta wear a truth belt? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Give me a picture of my soldier, please, Pastor Ann. Guys, there is something that's called a belt of truth. And I'm going to tell you about it in a second. But here's my, here's, my, here's my Roman soldier. This is how they used to dress up. For battle. Now, one thing that I want you to notice. You see the little brown piece that's going across the waist? That's the called the belt of truth. That's truth right there. And when, in, back in the Roman days, guys notice he ain't got no pants on. He got on a robe. He got on what looks like a dress. That is how they used to actually, that's what they used to wear back in biblical days. And one of the reasons why the Roman soldiers or the soldiers would wear belts around their waist is to keep excess fabric out of the way when they're going into battle. And so I thought about that thing, and the Lord says, yep, that's some of my people. That's some of my people. The reason why you got problems when it comes to spiritual battles is because you got too much excess. You don't put on your belt of truth, which gets rid of that excess. Excess relationships, excess friendships, excess attitude, excess sin. You think you hiding, but it's flapping all around everywhere. He says, I need you to get rid of the excess. And the belt of truth, when you put it on, it'll help you get rid of that. Now, what is the belt of truth? What is the belt of truth? What is truth? Matter of fact, in order to put on a belt of truth, you got to know first what truth is. Y'all go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. We got to find out what truth is before we can put it on. In Ephesians 4.21, it says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, oh no, wait a minute, since you have heard about Jesus, capital J-E-S-U-S, and have learned uh, the truth that comes from him, so that would suggest to me that Jesus is true. That Christ is truth. So the first part of you picking up your belt to put it on is you got to have a knowledge of the truth, which is Christ. Go to John chapter 17, 17. Is it 17, 17? I believe it's 17, 17. We're talking about truth. You got to know what truth is in order for you to put it on. It says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. <laughs> I think the King's Version says, the King Version, uh, King James Version says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In other words, not just Christ is truth, but the, his word is truth, guys. So in order for us to wear the belt of truth, we are first have to acknowledge that Christ is who he is and also acknowledge his standards. And then when you do that, you have to walk in that truth every single day. That's how you wear the belt of truth. Now listen. Y'all know the enemy. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. John, I believe it's 1010. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So the enemy has a tendency of telling lies. He has a tendency of telling lies. But what gets me is sometimes the enemy don't tell lies. He gives facts. He does. Sometimes he will speak to you, and he will give you facts. But, guys, let me tell you something. Facts is not always truth. Facts is not always truth. Let me help you. We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to read a lot of verses, but stay with me. Stay with me. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 1. You guys know this story. Verse 1 says, the Philistines, or the Philistines, however you want to say it, now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soko in Judah and Azekah at Ephesus Dement. Verse 2, Samuel countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Eli. Verse 3, so the Pharisees and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. Verse 4, Then Goliath, a Philistine.
Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall, fat. Verse 5, he wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed about 125 pounds. Goliath was a big boy. He was over nine feet tall, and he had armor that weighed over 125 pounds. Fat. Verse 6. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried his bronze javelin on his shoulder. Verse 7. The shaft of his spear, we're talking about the, the top part of his spear, was heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. So, guys, his spear was so big that the spearhead on top weighed about 15 pounds. So not only did Goliath have on a coat of mail or armor that was over 125 pounds, and he was over nine feet tall, but he also had bronze gear on. He also had a spear or a javelin that had a whole tip of it, 15 pounds. Keep going, keep going, Pastor Ant. Verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. See, this is where he messed up. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. Verse 9, if he kills me, we're going to be your slaves. But if I kill him, you're going to be our slaves. Verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight with me. Listen to Goliath. Verse 12. Oh, no, not 12, 16. We're going to drop down to verse 16. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israel army. Guys, every single day. So here's the picture. Give me, let me get you the picture. So on one side, it's the Philistines. On the other side, it's the, it's, it's the children of God, the people of Israel. And then in the middle was a valley. And every day. For 40 days, put the scripture back up there, Pastor Ann, please. For every, every day, for 40 days, Goliath would come out and taunt the people of Israel. He would come out and say, pick you somebody to fight. Can't nobody hold me. What? Who you going to do? Come on. Who you got? Bring them on out here. Bring them on. I defy your armies. I defy. Every day, Goliath did this. Every single day. Let's keep reading. Let's find out what happens in the story. Verse 17. Is it 17? One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Verse 18, give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain and how, uh, see how your brothers are getting along and bring me, bring, a, bring me a report back. See how they doing. Verse 19, David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Eli, fighting against the Philistines. So remember that picture, children of Israel on one side? David's brothers was in the midst of them. Let's keep reading, verse 21, or David's 20, uh, verse 20. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and cries. Verse 21, soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other. Army against army, there they go, with the valley in between them. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out of the ranks to go greet his brothers. So while the, keep, go to the next verse. So while they got the, you know, the, they got the valley in between, David runs out because he noticed they're going out for battle because he want to catch his brothers before they get to, get to the fight, right? And then look what happens. Next verse, as he was talking with them, now just as David was going to say, listen, daddy told me to bring y'all this lunch, and I'm just trying to see how y'all doing. As soon as he went to go ahead and talk with his brothers, the Bible says, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. There go Goliath. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. David heard him talking stuff, y'all. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away and in fright. So, guys, every single day, let me get this straight. 
we have the people of God, Israel, God's covenant people, going into battle with the Philistines who are not God's covenant people. And that one man, Goliath, he had coat of mail, 125 pounds. He was a big boy, and he was a champion. He was used to fighting. He had been fighting since he was a boy. So, yes, he had all that going for himself. But David heard him defy the armies of God. He said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. What's my next verse, Pastor Ant? What's my next verse? David said, wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Why y'all running? Why y'all? Why y'all running? The people said, have you seen this giant? This is the people of God, y'all. This is the people of Israel. Have you seen this giant? The men as he comes out each day to defy Israel. The king didn't even offer him a reward. Keep going. Verse 26. David asked the soldier standing, uh, what, what reward? What, what would the man get for taking him down? He said, wait a minute. Who going to, what the man going to get? For taking him down, who is this dude? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? The King James Version says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, who is this non-covenant dude? Sitting up here talking crap to y'all. And y'all running. Guys, I just come to tell you that's how we do someday. Every day we get up, the enemy will taunt us, taunt us, tell us what we not, tell us that we not enough, tell us that God ain't going to use us, tell us we can't do this and that we can't do that. And instead of us standing in the face of that Goliath, we go to run and we get scared. Then we depressed. Then we stressed. Then I don't even know what's wrong. I ain't nothing even happened, but I'm just stressed and depressed. That's because he's working on your mind, and you've allowed him to work on your mind, but not when you got on the belt of truth. Go to verse 32. Go to verse 32. So when David seen this dude, he's like, oh, no, see, uh-uh. Nope. Uh-uh. Nuh-uh. He went to King Saul, king over Israel. He went to King Saul, and he said, don't worry about this, Philistine. David said, I'll go fight him. I'll go fight him. Now listen to what Saul says. Listen to what the man of God says. Verse 33, don't be ridiculous. Saul replied, there is no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Listen at the man try to tell David, hey, you can't fight this dude. You better beware of people who are close to you, people that are on your, supposed to be on your team. You got to beware of those people when you say, nope, I'm going to pray until there's a change in my house. And they're like, oh, no, he's just being a boy. Oh, no, she's just being a girl. Nope, that's why you ain't got no power. I'm going to the throne of grace, and I'm going to snatch my family up if it's the last thing I do. Why don't we want to fight? David persisted. He kept telling Saul, uh-uh, I'm going. I'm going to fight him. I got him. Don't even worry about it. He said, listen, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, verse 35, he said, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, he said, I catch it by the jaw and then I club it to death. He says, I have done this to both the lion and the bear. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine, too, if he has def- for he has defiled the armies of the living God. Listen, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So Saul finally said, okay, you can go. Guys, listen to this. It was facts. Listen, David looked at that situation, and it, it was a lot of facts going on. David was a big dude. Yes, David was not, or I'm sorry, Goliath was a big dude. Yes, Goliath had coat of mail that was 125 pounds. Yes, he had been a champion since he was a youth. All of that was facts. But the truth of the matter is David had been with God, and he knew truth. And he had on his belt the truth. Why do you think he was able to write Psalms 23 when it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil because you are with me. Why do you think he was able to write Psalms 3 and 3 which says, Oh, Lord God, you are a shield for me. Listen, I'm pretty sure he got wind of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15, when it said that the battle was not mine, the battle was God's. David said, Yep, y'all know that that is all facts, but I got on my belt of truth. And because I live in truth and because I know who 
truth is, and because I acknowledge truth, yep, I'm coming in, devil, and I'm coming in hot. Because why don't we want to fight? Why don't we use our belt of truth, truth, knowing who Christ is, knowing his standards? Why don't we access that truth, living in that truth every single day? Why don't we wear our belt? Guys, I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes, this is the enemy's trick. He'll accuse you. He's an accuser. And I'm going to tell you, I had to deal with this my own self. He'll say, yeah, you had two kids out of the way a lot. Ain't nobody going to want to hear you. You may as well hang it up. Go sit down somewhere. Keep your mouth closed. It's over. Don't even do that. No fire. He will accuse you. He will run your list. Guys, have you ever just been sitting there and just a list of all the stuff that you have done that's not pleasing to God just show, just start coming up? He will get, he will run you that list. But let me tell you something. I love the show, The First 48. Anybody watch The First 48? The, in The First 48, the police have 48 hours when a crime is committed to actually get evidence so they can actually put a charge on a suspect. Okay? So what happens is they'll gather some evidence and then sometimes once they get enough evidence, they want to talk to the actual suspect. So what they'll do is they'll call the suspect in. And they'll t question the suspect. And they'll say this and this and this and this and that. And this and this is the evidence that we have. And sometimes they won't even tell them the evidence. They'll just have it in their back pocket. But guys, sometimes when they do those interviews, the person be like, oh, that wasn't me. You, may, you go ask John John. I was with John John. Some of y'all, when the enemy goes accusing you, you better tell them your alibi. You better tell them your alibi. An alibi is one who actually gives a statement that will actually relinquish blame or punishment to another individual. So when the enemy go telling you, hey, you was a fornicator. Hey, you was a shacker up. Hey, you had two kids out of wedlock. Stand, stand up toe to toe in the spirit with him and say, yep, but check my alibi. And my alibi is Jesus. And when the enemy goes to Jesus, he going to say, guess what? She was with me. He was with me. You cannot charge him because I'm their alibi. Why are we not accessing the spiritual tools of God? And then the enemy can come in. And you want to know why you're stressed and depressed. We're not standing up with our belt of truth. Six fourteen. Pastor Ann, can you put that back? Six fourteen. Stand your ground, so we got to stand. Putting on the belt of truth, so listen, we got truth, we got Christ, we acknowledge his standards, we acknowledge his ways and him, and we walk in that truth every day. We live authentically to truth, so we got on our belt in truth, right? But then also, it says, and the body armor of God's righteousness. Put my soldier back on the board. Put my soldier back up. So wait a minute. We got the belt, which is here, but does everybody see what a blessed breastplate of righteousness is? It is that metal piece that connects to that brown belt. There goes the blessed breastplate of, of righteousness right there. Notice that the breastplate of righteousness is connected to the belt. You mean righteousness is connected to truth? Uh-huh, because it, it makes no sense, guys, for you to acknowledge truth, that for you to acknowledge Christ, for you to acknowledge his standards, and for you to try to authentically walk in that every day, and then you don't do right. <laughs> what is the point of knowing what God wants you to do and you don't do it? What is the point of knowing what the right thing is to do and you don't do it? So truth, the belt, and righteousness work hand in hand. Guys, tell me something. Put my, put my uh, soldier back up there. Tell me something. What is the breastplate covering? Say it again. It's, it's covering the torso. What else is it covering? The heart. What else is it covering? The lungs. Guys, it's covering all the vital organs to keep your tail alive. 
So when we don't have on the breastplate of righteousness, and I'm going to tell you what that means or how to do that, when we don't have on the breastplate of righteousness, we leave ourselves exposed to the enemy and his tactics and his trends. We leave ourselves exposed. We leave ourselves unprotected. You mean to tell me that just by being holy and just doing right, I'm protected? Yeah. You commit no crime, you do no time. Holiness will protect you. Right living will protect you. All right. Okay. Listen. Righteousness covers. Listen, one thing I want to bring out, guys, we're not talking about righteous living according to your standards. Because a lot of stuff that we call right is completely wrong. And stuff that we call wrong is completely right. So we're not talking about right according to your standards. We're talking about according to God's righteousness. What, what is the scripture? 2 Corinthians 5, I believe, 20, 21, somewhere up in there. It says that God made him who didn't know no sin. He became sin for us so that we can be made the righteousness of God. In other words, here goes Jesus, righteousness. Here I go, sin. And like pastor I always say, we switch places. I became the righteousness of God, and Jesus became sin. So we're not trying to do this thing by our own righteousness, because then you'll think that God owes you something. We're talking about having on a brick. Listen, God don't owe you nothing. He's trying to give you tools so that you don't go out there and get beat up. Guys, we got to live right. There is no point in knowing the truth of Christ, knowing it, acknowledging his standards, and then we don't do them. This is what happens. You have to put the, you got to put the breastplate on. How do you put it on? God's communion with Christ, communion with God, your prayer, your word time. That's how you put on your, bre- your, your, your breastplate. This is what happens. The more time, I know, what is the scripture? Matthew 6, 33a, the front part of it, says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his what? His righteousness. Guys, the more time that you spend with God, the more time that you commune with him, then his choices become your choices. His ways become your ways, and you practically live that stuff out every day, henceforth, putting on your breastplate of righteousness. It's doing what it is that Christ, what is his truth? What does Christ say? Guys, when we get into circumstances and situations, even if we ain't got time to run it through the Bible, we need to still be going to the better truth. We still need still to be going to try Christ. Bouncing that stuff off Christ. Okay. Let me help you. I'm going to be practical. I'm going to be practical. So, you get a text. You get a text at 11.30 p.m. It's old dude. He's saying, come over so I can watch a movie. Now, you already know, even though you ain't got no Bible in front of you right then and there, what the Bible says. It says free uh, youthful lust, right? You know that that is not a situation that you need to be in. But when you, God, guys, why do we, why do we, oh, but I'm not sinning. I'm just going to go over there. I'm just going to watch this movie. What, 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 you, any, any time you tell, guys, have you ever been in a situation where it ain't no Bible, but you hear the Holy Spirit say, uh-uh, don't do that. Uh-uh, close your mouth. Uh-uh, don't even go there. And when you tell God no, every time you tell him no, whether that's you looking at his logos, his written word, or whether he gives you rhema and he just said, ah, ah, whether he gives you a word right then in that moment, any time you tell him no, you're essentially taking off your breastplate. And then you're leaving yourself exposed. Because nine times out of ten, guys, when you say yes to old boy and you go over there and you left your, bre- your, 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 your arm or you didn't left, the God dang on breastplate at home. When you get over there, there's nothing to keep you. There's nothing to protect you. So nine times out of ten, now you're in an entanglement. Oh, y'all are not going to tell the truth, but I am going to tell the truth because I've been there, done that. Now you're in an entanglement, and then three, four, five, six years later, you're wondering, now how in the world did I get here? And it was all because you loosened your, bless, your breastplate. 
every time you tell God no, you're essentially loosing it up and just. God showed me. He said, that's, 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 what a lot of, that's where a lot of my church is, right there. They know me. They know the truth. They acknowledge the truth. But they want to do what they want to do. And then you wonder why years pass by and you ain't got no victory. Why you still dealing with the same stuff that you dealt with when you was 21, 22, 23, and you 35? Because we don't want to do right. We don't want to live right. Guys, do you know that there is a such thing? And I'm almost done. Do you know that there is a such thing as wearing your armor incorrectly? There is a such thing as wearing your armor incorrectly. If I had an umbrella, an umbrella is a tool, right? If I had an umbrella and I took the umbrella and I, and I opened it up, first of all, what is an umbrella used for to protect me from what? The rain. So if I had that tool and I opened it up but I left it down by my feet and it started raining, guys, I'm still going to get wet. If I had an oven mitt and I took the oven mitt and I only put it on the front part of my fingers and didn't put it on my whole hand and I went to get something out of the oven, I'm still going to get burned. So what the Holy Spirit showed me was that some people are using, they, 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 they ain't wearing their stuff correctly. Yep, they may say I got the, 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 the belt of truth. Yep, I got on the breastplate of righteousness, but they're wearing it incorrectly. Let me tell you how you do that. When you want to take the word of God and fit it so that it, it can kind of accommodate your lifestyle, you have just now worn your breastplate incorrectly. Anytime you do that, you are not perfectly or strapped in properly, so you still leave yourself exposed. Listen, I hear a lot of people, I, I, listen, this is the excuse that people use. Listen, I'm saved by grace. I'm saved. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe he died for my sins, and I believe him in my heart. And yes, I am saved, and you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do and when I want to do it. Wearing the breastplate incorrectly because, yes, you are saved by grace. And, yes, your belief in Jesus Christ is what gives you your salvation. But if you think that that's going to cover you when you it's time for to go up against the devil and his demons, uh -uh, you exposed. The Bible says, uh, what is it, Romans chapter 6? He said, listen, so what, we going to just sin so we can have a whole bunch of grace? He said, uh-uh, how can any of you who have have, been, have died to sin, keep living in it over and over and over and over again. Guys, that is the difference between you living a victorious life in Christ and for you just being a believer. That is the difference. Is One of the main differences is your breastplate of righteousness. Have you ever seen Christians and it just seems like ain't nothing ever going right for them? They always in some type of buffoonery, some type of debauchery. They always in something here or there. Nine times out of ten. They didn't have on their breastplate. God's holiness will protect you. Think about this. Let's say, for instance, you went to work. And it's, I don't know, a robbery. It's a robbery. And they find out that whoever robbed the place had access to the building. But you was in your office doing your work as unto the Lord, doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And then when they go to check the account and they're going to say, now, wait a minute. It wasn't Kenya's badge that was used to get in here. Because I was over doing what I was supposed to do. I was out of harm's way. I was protected because I was doing what I was supposed to do. Guys, the reason why sometimes we're not protected is because we don't do what we're supposed to do. We got this whole attitude. How can the man of God tell me anything? He's a man just like I'm a man. He ain't got no authority over me. He ain't got no... 
they're just another man or they're just, they're just another man or they're just another woman. That's what we like to tell ourselves. You better humble yourself and put on your breastplate. You better humble yourself and put on your breastplate. It will keep you out of trouble. We know, most people know about Christ. Most, even if they deny him, they know about him. They know about Christ. We know that. But us believers, we don't just acknowledge him. We acknowledge his standards. We walk in that every day. We put on our, our, our belt of truth. And then when we really want to see victory in our lives, when we really don't want to see, listen, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 6, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against powers, principalities, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Guys, that's what we got to fight every day as a believer. We got to fight powers and principalities. How in the world can I overcome power? How can I do that? That sounds pretty scary to me. You ain't got to be scared. Put on your, your, your belt of truth and put on your breastplate of righteousness. It, that already going to give you a head start. Guys, this stuff is spiritual. Put that belt on and get rid of that excess. What has God told you to get rid of that you're still dragging along? Y'all know, what is it, Linus on, uh, what is it, Linus on Charlie Brown? Carry around that blanket, just nasty. Just carrying around that thing because it gives them comfort. But when you look at that, even when you look at it on TV, it's got the little effects where you can tell it's stinking and it's dirty and it's just, it, it, and not only that, he's dragging it around and now when he drags it around his friends, it could affect them. Get rid of the excess. Whatever it is God had told you to get rid of, get rid of it. He said, I want you to be victorious. I want you to be who I've called you to be. Get rid of the excess. Put on me and my truth and my standards and live in that authentically every day. And then go a step further than that. Commune with me. Talk to me. Pray with me. Get into my words so that I can then show you what my righteousness looks like. And then you can walk in that, and I promise you, it'll keep you out of some trouble. It'll keep your heart protected. Guys, why do you think the Bible says guard your heart? And I'm just going to do a, I know Pastor says KLT version, but we both have the same. No, uh, this KMT version. That's what it is, the KMV version. Kim Monet Verner version. Guys, when he said guard your heart, in other words, put on your breastplate. Put it on. Guard this. Because a lot of times the first place that the enemy starts is here and then it creeps down into here. And then the next thing you do, you're acting. You're acting. You've taken your breastplate off and now you're in the, in, in the action. Now you're telling God no. Now your breastplate's off. Now you're exposed. Now you got all kind of stuff going on. Or now you find yourself in situations and circumstances you ain't got no business being in. If you had just said yes to God versus no to God. Put on your breastplate. Now I know, I'm closing. I know that some of us find ourselves in this scripture. You say, you know what, sis? I was wondering what was going on. I remember, I said no to God when he asked for my yes. When he said, no, don't do it, I did it anyway. I took off my breastplate. That's me. The good thing about God is he's so gracious and he's so merciful. So even when you make those mistakes, his grace just scoops you up. And as long as you've got breath, a breath in your body, you have an opportunity to to redeem yourself. You have an opportunity. You may not have put on the breastplate yesterday. You may not have even worn the belt of truth. But you can do it today. That's the good thing about God. He doesn't hold. You got an alibi. It doesn't matter what the enemy says, how he wants to accuse you. Say, yep, I did it, devil. That's all facts. But the truth is, I've asked Jesus. 
to come into, I believe in him. I believe that he died. And so that makes me say, that's the truth. And it's super spiritual facts. He's my alibi. Guys, this is what I want you to do. This is between you and God. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about when you took off your breastplate, it might have been recent. When you took off your belt of truth, think about where that left you. And I want you to begin to just pray if you want it. Listen, God is very, very, he, he's very polite. He's not going to make you. You have a choice. The Bible says, choose ye this day. That means that the decision is on you. Guys, if there's anybody in here that says, I need to even put on my, my, my belt or two, I don't. I want to know who Christ is. I want to know what his standards are. I want to acknowledge them and live authentically every day in them. Just talk to God. You don't have to raise your hand. Listen, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in who does it. I just want those of you who are in that space, I just want you to do it. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I realize now I wasn't using my tools. I wasn't using my tools. Now, Father, help me. Help me to get up every day. Spend time with you. Love on you. Listen to you. Read your word. And so that I can every day go out and have my tools. So that I can represent you well. So that I can be protected by righteous living. Father, help me. I don't want to keep making the same mistakes. Now, if there's anybody who knows that if you were to die right now, you don't know if you would be with Jesus. Today is your lucky day. God does not care about what you did yesterday or the day before that or the day before that. What he wants is a sincere heart. If you're not sure that if you die, that you would go to be with Jesus. But you want to know, if I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. Put him on your heart. Put him on your heart. Say, God, that's me. Say, Jesus, that's me. And we're going to pray a prayer together. The Bible says... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him won't perish. They'll have everlasting life. So, God, so guys, if you just believe on him, God is gracious and merciful enough God, to, to forgive you. And be your savior. Let's pray. If that's you, dear God, here I am, just like I am. Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you rose again with all power in your hand. I believe that you are exactly who you say you are. Now, God, 
I need you. I need your spirit. I want to walk in your way. Lead me, God. Direct me, God. Take complete control, God. I want to hear your voice. I want to give your voice a yes. I love you. I'm saved. I'm saved. And I'm saved. Guys, give God a hand praise. It's really that simple. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be a member for six months and then you get saved. As a matter of fact, you could have did this at home on your living room couch. And if you meant it, and if you really genuinely believe it, that's that on that. Now your names are written in heaven, in the book of life. That is something to celebrate. I don't care if it was somebody online. I really don't care. One soul is a-okay with me. That's one less person the devil can take down to hell with him. Guys, we're going to go. Stand up, everyone all over the room. We're going to pray and we're going to go. But God, I just hope even one thing, even one seed of the word of God sticks with you. And when you go throughout this week and the enemy try to taunt you and he tries to be the Goliath in your life, go ahead and tell him to check your alibi. Go ahead and tell them what the truth of what God's words say, what you know to be true. Go ahead and tell them if all you know is I gave my life to Christ on Sunday, use it. It's a tool, use it. It's truth, use it. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We appreciate you for another opportunity to be able to join together in your name. Father, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your presence. God, now what I'm asking is that some seed of your word would be planted on good ground of your people. Lord God, to where they would use it, that they would recognize that they have weapons that they can use against the enemy and his tactics and his lies. Lord, let them start to use those things. Let them start speaking. Let them start saying what the truth of what you are and your standards and who they are in you. Bless them to start speaking that over their lives so they won't walk around defeated and mistreated and stressed. Father God, I'm asking that this word would break yokes, break chains. Father God, if all they can remember is that you are their alibi, let that be what they use to break through. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, let it take root, let it grow, and let there be fruit in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would take each and every one of us home. Bless us through the week, Father. Give us safekeeping. Charge your angels around us. Uh, charge your angels around us, Father. Give us a song in our hearts, Lord God. A song in our spirits, Father. Give us joy unspeakable. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed.